Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, this is a virtual session of ACCEE's upcoming conference on health, environment, and energy. And my name is Cassandra Cubes, and I will be moderating today's webinar. And a few logistics before we get started here. Um, uh, all attendees are in listen-only mode, so please type any questions that you have into the chat box, and we will hold Q&A for the end of the webinar. And we're going to keep this webinar to under an hour. Um, so this webinar is also being recorded and will be available on ACCEE's YouTube page, and we'll be sending out a follow-up email to all webinar registrants uh, afterwards with a link to where you can find that. So first a bit about ACCEE, for some background. Uh, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, or ACCEE, is a 501c3 nonprofit founded in 1980, and we conduct research and analysis and act as a catalyst to advance energy efficiency. And in early 2017, we launched our health and environment program. And um, our team on the health and environment program is dedicated to helping people understand how energy efficiency affects our environment and health, both indoors and out. And I work on our H&E team along with J.R. Denson and Sarah Hayes, who leads the program and who will be speaking shortly. And so here are our webinar speakers today. We have a very distinguished list of experts that you'll be able to hear from on this virtual session. First, we'll have Sarah Hayes, who, as I said, leads our health and environment program here at ACCEE. Then we'll be hearing from Laura Rodorma, who's a lead analyst with customer energy management at National Grid. Then we'll hear from Jalan White Newsom, who's a senior program officer for environment at the Craig City Foundation. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Mona Sar Sarfati, who's the executive director of the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. So first, uh, we'll hear from Sarah Hayes, who leads ACCEE's work related to health and environment. She manages the program and oversees a research team focused on identifying opportunities to use energy efficiency to reduce pollution and improve human health. Sarah serves on the US EPA's Clean Air Act Advisory Committee and has over 15 years of experience working on policy and regulation related to the implementation of the Clean Air Act in federal rulemakings and in states. And prior to joining ACEEE in 2010, Sarah worked at a boutique law, Wall Street law firm where she advised clients on transactions in energy and environmental markets and emissions trading and worked for the Ozone Transport Commission. She has a JD from Fordham Law School and is a licensed attorney in the state of New York and has a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from Lewis and Clark College. So take it away, Sarah. Thank you, Cassandra. And uh, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, we. What we were trying to accomplish with this webinar, at least in part, is to give people a little bit of a flavor of um, some of the topics that they might hear about um, or have an opportunity to discuss at our upcoming conference in New Orleans uh, in December. So this is our first ever conference on uh, health, environment, and energy and really looking at the intersect of all those issues. So I'm going to just talk very briefly right now and give you a flavor for how ACEEE thinks about this issue and specifically how energy efficiency relates to health in our view um, and what some of the opportunities are and then some of the themes that we uh, anticipate looking at in 2019. So this first slide um, is from a project that we did where we looked at uh, the air quality impacts of reducing energy uh, consumption and how that translates to health. And I'm not going to actually go through the details of this slide. I really put it up there to convey um, that one of the ways we are looking at this and, and um, engaging in research in this space is to um, think about how energy efficiency affects air quality and how the, those impacts affect people and people's health. Uh, next slide, please. You probably already clicked it. There's a little bit of delay on my end. Um, but the, the next slide addresses, this is actually not um, our graphic. This is a graphic that came for, um, from a report put out by E for the Future. And um, 
but it gets at, I, I think it encapsulates well some of the issues um, around one of the other ways we come at this, which is how energy efficiency affects health of people in the buildings that they're in. So um, if you live in a home, there's all kinds of ways that energy efficiency use the energy use and energy efficiency measures might affect your health. And this is a visual describing some of those ways. Um, and if you can click to the next slide, um, I will, in 2019, we're gonna be, oh, actually I forgot we had this in here. Um, Cass, can you please play the video? I wanted to show this because um, this, I think does a great job of um, illustrating some of those linkages. So I'll stop and let it play. It's a very short, three minutes. I'm not getting any sound. My two-year-old son um, was diagnosed with asthma pretty early on. I didn't know much about asthma. I knew what it was with the respiratory issue, but I didn't know that it had triggers and it advances really fast. He would have a lot of asthmatic reactions at home. so. I started to think about what's making him go off, what's making his, you know, respiratory issues even worse. My seven-year-old was diagnosed with asthma at um, two years old. Um, he still suffers from late asthma attacks at some point during the season, like when it's um, like a big weather change from like winter to winter to spring. So I have to make sure that we maintain the proper temperature. Sandra. <laughs> um, so there we have uh, that video and a few others that we've made available on the website and we'll have a link to our uh, page at the end of the video. But 
Um, I just wanted to share that because I think it does a nice job of explaining um, some of the reasons why we think this is an important space to be working in. And then uh, next slide, please. Just to quickly hit on some of the stuff that we're going to um, address in 2019, some of the themes that we think are important. Um, we uh, are going to be identifying, um, assessing the impact of energy efficiency is having on people's health. So that's kind of the first bullet there is a project where we're going to be looking at that. Um, identifying intersections where partners uh, across these sectors will be mutually, can work together, can partner to um, have mutually beneficial outcomes. And looking at funding and braiding, blending, and layering those resources is one way that we're going to be doing that. Um, we know, I think most people know and appreciate that energy efficiency reduces greenhouse gases, but it's also a tool um, that can be used to mitigate health impacts of climate change. So we're gonna be exploring that in 2019. And all of these themes will come up um, at our conference. Next slide, please. In uh, December in New Orleans, we'll be holding the conference and uh, we wanted to just flag that registration is almost full. And um, if you register before the 8th, you can avoid late fees. But also, I kind of think it might fill up before then. We don't know for sure. Um, depends on what everybody else decides to do, but we're getting close. So um, I'm going to stop there and invite um, our next speakers, all of whom are involved and um, supporting the conference in various ways, to share a little bit about what they think the opportunities are in this space. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. And next, we will be hearing from Laura Rodor Rodorma, who is a lead analyst in the Customer Energy Management Team for National Grid. And she's responsible for developing strategies for new residential energy efficiency programs and enhancing existing programs on behalf of National Grid, its stakeholders, and regulators. And specific program responsibilities that she focuses on include working on the Residential New Construction Program, the Income Eligible Services Program, and the High Efficiency Heating and Cooling and Hot Water uh, Heating Programs. And Laura graduated from St. Lawrence University with a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Environmental mm -hmm. Science. And with that, I'll hand things over to Laura. Great, thanks, Cassandra. Um, so National Grid is, for those of you that don't know, is an electric and gas utility company serving customers across New York State, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. And we implement energy efficiency programs that create significant energy savings, economic benefits, and improve health and comfort for our customers and communities, um, many of which we just heard in the last presentation. And Laura, sorry to interrupt you, but if you could um, talk a little bit more into the phone, it's, just, it's, a, it's a bit hard to hear you. Okay, sure, not a problem. That's much better, thanks. Is that better? Okay, great. And then it, um, the next slide is great. And uh, on to the next one, sorry. There we go. Great. Um, fantastic. So uh, I work specifically in Rhode Island. And in Rhode Island, we uh, National Grid conducts about 13,000 in-home energy assessments per year, which allows us direct access into customers' homes to assess energy needs and potentially health-related opportunities. And the, health, the, the energy assessment includes a top-to-bottom review of a home with a focus on energy, safety inspections, installation of instant savings measures such as uh, light bulbs, shower heads, power strips, and then we provide recommendations for energy savings opportunities. So we get that we get that time with the customer for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And as you can imagine, the energy assessment process alone is about a two to three hour process. And installation of insulation or heating systems or appliances takes even more time, you know, additional days, and which is a big time investment for many. And for some customers, it's not possible for them to take the time. So expensive, wasted energy, and sometimes safety issues go undetected. Next slide, please. And one of our other areas of opportunity for in-home engagement um, through the energy efficiency program 
is through our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning program. And so if a customer is in need of a new hot water tank or a boiler or furnace or air conditioning system, a contractor will go into their home and assess the status of their equipment and the, um, the load that their home has and look for opportunities for repair or replacement. So again, an opportunity for our direct vendors to have the one-on-one -on -one conversation with customers. And we have many other EE programs, energy efficiency programs that connect directly with customers, uh, but more through um, different media such as email and mail and uh, uh, billboards and marketing campaigns, et cetera. So we have the opportunity to convey messages that tie energy efficiency and health um, through those tr uh, traditional channels. Next slide, please. So why are we discussing the intersection of energy efficiency and health? Well, we're really proud of the benefits that come through energy efficiency with the cost savings and improvements, thermal comfort and, and health too, but we think that there can be more. We think we have an opportunity with, um, with the direct contact that we have with so many customers each year to be able, be able to dive deeper into our conversation. Also, we recognize that energy efficiency programs pose a challenge due to the time commitment and understand that impact to our customers, especially those in the low-income communities. And we witness that there are potential health and safety measures that a customer could benefit from, but sometimes they're not addressed because it, it entails another phone call or more time off of work, and so sometimes it just doesn't happen. So through our well-established energy efficiency programs, National Grid has earned the reputation for being a trusted entity to deliver in-home energy services. And as such, the company is uniquely positioned to support the discussion of adding health intervention measures to our well-established capability of delivering energy services. And so the opportunities, again, we heard in the, in the previous presentation about really trying to encourage our customers to move forward with weatherization and heating system upgrades and maintaining mechanical systems in order to add the um, uh, benefits of the health impacts and mitigate mold issues or reduce stress related to exposure and temperature changes or reduce the amount of pollen and outdoor air um, pollution that comes inside. So we recognize the importance of this intersection of energy efficiency and health as a way to bring even greater value to customers through our delivery model, which can save time and money and improve the health and well-being of our customers. And we look forward to exploring the potential within our regulatory framework and working with many of you on this call. Thank you. Great, thank you, Laura. And next, we will be hearing from Jalan White Newsom, who is a senior program officer with the Presby Foundation. And Jalan is um, responsible for the Energy Environment Program, excuse me, the Environment Program's grant portfolio on climate resilience and equitable water systems. She also leads the foundation's work addressing the intersection of climate change and public health. And before joining Kresge in early 2016, Jalon served as the Director of Federal Policy at WE Act, where she was involved with leading national campaigns and a 42-member National Coalition of Environmental Justice Organizations. She's an adjunct professor at the George Washington University and holds a PhD in Environmental Health Sciences from University of Michigan School of Public Health, a Master's in Environmental Engineering from Southern Methodist University, and a Bachelor's in Chemical Engineering from Northwestern University. So, Jalone, I'll bring up your slide here, and you can uh, go ahead and take it away. All right, awesome. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction and the opportunity to be a part of this webinar. I'm going to start with a story. Um, when I graduated uh, with my degree in chemical engineering, my first job was working for a chemical plant in the wonderful state of Texas. And as a process engineer, I saw firsthand how the use of energy, the production of energy, can actually make great things, but also cause irreversible impacts on the health and wealth of communities. And so it just so happened that the neighborhood that we were in, our facility, where we work 24 hours, seven days a week, was predominantly a low-income community and a community of color. And what I learned from my first job and what I've seen firsthand as I've traversed the environmental field from various sectors and various viewpoints is that the way we extract our energy, 
the way we use our energy directly impacts the health of communities across this country. And that became even clearer as I started my climate change research, really looking at energy use in homes and the impacts on low-income populations, particularly the elderly in Detroit and cities across this country. So for me, the importance of intersectionality in my work has always been a priority, as well as protecting the health of our communities. And so whether it was working in an engineering plant or advocating on Capitol Hill, this is extremely important because the health of our communities continues to be on the line every day and we can no longer afford to silo our different efforts because what you do in the energy sector and in health and in engineering is all connected. So to say the least, I'm really excited about the upcoming and first ACEEE conference on health, environment, and energy to be held in New Orleans in a couple of weeks. So for those of you that might not be familiar with the Kresge Foundation, um, we work nationally and we provide grants to support the work of various organizations, including professional networks, community-based organizations, nonprofits, anchor institutions, and sometimes supporting meetings like ACEEE that are really aligned with our strategic goals. So for the past 94 years, the Kresge Foundation, we're headquartered in the Detroit metro area in the state of Michigan, has had a mission to build and strengthen pathways to opportunity for low-income people in America's cities and seeking to also dismantle structural and systemic barriers to equality and justice. And we try our best to exhibit that through our grant-making practice. So as a senior program officer on our environment team at the foundation, I am blessed with the opportunity to lead our work building climate resilience in our water systems, addressing urban flooding, and also some grant making at the intersection of climate change and health. I'm also a member of our internal core team, which core stands for Kresge Operationalizing Racial Equity, that is working to address racial equity in philanthropy, but also within the, the walls of our own foundation. So the conversation and work of ACEEE is important to our program for several reasons. In our environment program, we focus on climate resilience. And our definition of climate resilience is comprehensive in that we support work that focuses on mitigation, so looking at reducing the sources of carbon pollution. We support work that works on adaptation, how we deal in our new normal. And we also support work that addresses social cohesion, how we support efforts that build the capacity of communities. So understanding ways that we can advance energy efficiency policies, programs, technologies, investments, and behaviors is right up our alley. And this work is led by my colleague, Jessica Bielan. And particularly with ACEEE, we're supporting as an example, the development of a scorecard that's gonna actually assess the efficiency policy frameworks in various large US cities across this country. And really what are some of the equity centered metrics to really understand the extent to which efficiency investments serve low income households. And that's just a part of the work. But what's also pretty cool is that we work across teams at our foundation. So for several years, our environment and our health team have been working together at the intersection of climate change, health, and equity. And so we continue to support organizations like Healthcare Without Harm that are reducing the carbon footprint of hospitals. We're supporting professional societies who you'll hear from Mona very shortly, like the Medical Society Consortium, um, APHA, American Public Health Association. So we are looking at the work with doctors, nurses, practitioners at this intersection of climate change, health, and equity uh, for a while, and it's something we're excited about. And what's even more exciting is that early next year, we will be releasing a new part of our climate change, health, and equity initiative that is solely going to be focused on building the capacity of community-based organizations, which will be one of the largest cross-team initiatives within our foundation. So this next step of ACEEE integrating health and equity into conversations around energy efficiency is so necessary. It's not an option at this time in our lives. But what I will challenge us all on the phone, on this webinar, as you participate in the upcoming meeting, is that while we tackle these big issues, we cannot forget that addressing racial equity within our own institutions and with the systems that we deal with on a daily basis, we have to address it because if not, we will continue to perpetuate injustice and inequity, and it has to be an intentional part of our work moving forward, whether we're working in energy, public health, whatever. So the way we extract our energy, the way we use our energy, the resources we create to tackle climate change, how we prepare and adapt and respond to climate change, 
all of these things have the potential to cause more harm and hurt for low-income communities and communities of color if we don't ask that critical question of who will benefit. So I look forward and I challenge each of you during the meeting in December and even in your work now to be intersectional, to address racial equity, and remember who this work should serve for the better good. Again, thanks for this opportunity and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Sean. And next, uh, actually, before I go uh, to our next speaker, I just want to remind everyone to continue to type your questions into the chat box, and we will get to them at the end of all of our presentations. And finally, we will be hearing from Dr. Mona uh, Sarfati, who is the Executive Director of the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. And um, the, the Medical Society is based within the George Mason, Mason University Center for Climate Change Communication. And the consortium was established after several years of collaboration with medical societies to assess physician attitudes and experience regarding the health effects of climate change and to really increase engagement of physicians and their associations on the issues of climate change, sustainability, and clean power. As a family medicine professor and physician for over 30 years, Dr. Sarfati has engaged in research and teaching focused on primary care, cancer screening, and public policy, including the health effects of climate change. She has lectured at national and regional venues, including medical societies, health plans, health departments, professional organizations, and government conferences, and has published articles and book chapters on climate change and health. So with that, I'll hand things over to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that introduction. Um, and uh, so the first slide in a medical talk usually focuses on um, on uh, disclosures, meaning any kind of financial conflict of interest. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, I don't have financial uh, conflicts of interest to disclose, but I use this slide to illustrate uh, the newest members of our family, the next generation coming along, and uh, this definitely gets me up and working uh, on these issues every day. Next slide. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to keep this very short uh, because I think we're uh, uh, running out of time, but um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the research that we did about physicians' views on climate change. Uh, how we formed a group, the consortium, um, with what's basically a communication mission. Um, and we put out a report about the health harms of climate change that includes four physician stories uh, for physicians who have dealt with climate change impacts on health either in their personal lives or in their communities. Um, and um, talk a little bit about the activities of the consortium um, and also the health benefits of climate solutions, including clean energy and energy efficiency, which are two very important solutions. Next slide. So um, when we started this uh, project several years ago, we surveyed uh, three medical societies, um, and we found out uh, that there were very uh, similar kind of um, results across all three societies we surveyed. Uh, physicians knew in numbers larger than the population at large that climate change is occurring. They knew that it was mostly human caused, if not entirely human caused. Um, they thought it was directly relevant to their patient care practice. Uh, and about half thought it was harming their own patients a great deal or moderately. Another 20% thought it was harming their own patients at least a little. Um, and the main areas of harm they perceived were air pollution related uh, problems. Uh, allergies and injuries due to extreme weather events. Next slide. Uh, we asked them what they would like to see happen, um, and they were very clear that they wanted their own societies to speak out about climate change, um, and they, uh, they wanted more continuing medical education. They felt physicians had a responsibility to educate the public um, and their own patients. Um, and they also felt that uh, doctors should take a lead on environmental sustainability in their own workplaces. Next slide, please. So because of this, uh, we formed the organization, the consortium, 
And we started with a small group, eight societies, and we're now at 22, and those societies represent over half the doctors in the, in the United States. Um, and we are approaching climate change from the health side. Um, we don't want to be thought of as being uh, a political group uh, or even an environmental group. Uh, we really are, are working on this because of our concern about health and the people that we take care of. Next slide, please. So uh, we all agreed, to, all the societies agreed to a consensus statement, and you can find that at our website, which is down there in very small letters in the lower left, uh, medsocietiesforclimatehealth.org. Um, and so you can go ahead and, and take a look at that if you like. Next slide, please. These are the societies that uh, together represent over half the physicians in America. And you can see all the largest societies are there. Uh, the ACP, which represents internists, the AAP, which is pediatricians, the AAFP, which are the family physicians, the American Medical Association, and so on. Um, and uh, you can uh, see this also on our website. Next slide, please. This is the report that we put out in March of 2017 that has those four physician stories that I uh, mentioned. Um, and it describes the mission of the consortium, which is to organize, empower, and amplify the voices of America's doctors to convey how climate change is harming our health and how climate solutions will improve it. Next slide, please. So um, climate solutions are health solutions. And this is the very fortuitous uh, understanding um, that we have developed and we try to convey to others, which is that the things that we do to um, protect our atmosphere also are beneficial to health. So if we use clean renewable energy and emit no greenhouse gases and don't pollute the air, this is better for ch children's lung development, it's less ha hazardous for adults, um, and if we use less energy by embracing energy efficiency, we also cause less pollution. And as you heard in the introduction, um, this can lead to better health as well. Active transportation, meaning walking, biking, and public transportation also doesn't pollute and it increases the exercise that people get, which we know is, is healthy. Um, diets that have more vegetables and less meat uh, produce less methane because they're less reliant on uh, cattle production. Um, and these are closer to med Mediterranean diets, which we know to be especially healthy um, and are now recommended by the Department of Agriculture. Um, and then cities that have more trees and greenery absorb more carbon dioxide. And since trees and greenery also transpire, meaning they put a little moisture into the air, which evaporates and cools the air, they help to protect people from heat. Next slide, please. So um, we have these as banners um, at a booth that we bring to um, conventions, to Medical Society annual meetings. Uh, and this says what you can do now to address climate change, eat and move for wellness and sustainability. Um, and the particulars there are cultivate energy saving habits, buy electricity from renewable sources if you can, uh, go for 100% if you can, uh, choose active transport, eat less meat, buy locally grown fruits and vegetables, and also of course avoid disposable water bottles and carry usable containers to decrease plastic pollution. Next slide, please. Um, and then be a voice for a better future. And so you can learn how climate change affects your health and your community's health. Um, and tell policymakers, communicate with them that you want solutions to climate change um, and ask them what they plan to do to address it. Um, and a couple of resources, additional resources, uh, are divest invest, and this is about divesting from fossil fuels. Uh, if you are part of an organization, um, they can consider doing this and uh, not be left with stranded assets as we move away from fossil fossil fuels and into renewables. Um, and then you can stay in touch with us by signing up on our website. And I think that's it. Next slide. Thank you. 
Great. Thanks so much. And thank you to all of our presenters. I think this session really highlighted all the diversity of thought and expertise that we're hoping to get out of our conference, uh, our upcoming conference in December. So hopefully for all of those listening who are interested in, in hearing more about these topics and kind of how energy, environment, and, and health all intersect, and um, please consider registering for the conference. As Sarah said, space is very much limited at this point. Um, so you can, um, uh, if you haven't already looked at the conference site already, it's acee.org slash conferences, and you can find uh, the health conference listed there. So now we will move into, uh, here's some ACEEE resources on our health and environment program, also available on ACEEE's website, and as well as some of our upcoming conferences. Um, but I'll leave this up as we move to our Q&A session, and we have quite a few questions coming in. And for anyone who um, hasn't gotten their question in, please feel free to type it into the chat box. Uh, we are looking to end things under an hour today, um, so we'll get to as many questions as we can to, to stay within that promise. And um, the first question I'll put probably to Sarah here, it's, um, what are you hoping to get out of this health conference? Is it more of an opportunity to network or um, more so to move the ball forward on specific topics? Um, what, what a good question. So I, I think it um, largely depends on the person who's attending. So um, I do think it will be a great place to network, um, but I also think um, it's it will be the kind of environment that will help foster um, thinking and new ideas and exposure to other perspectives. Um, and I think that's something that's always helpful um, in terms of uh, advancing um, thinking about uh, in, at, in a space. So this, as far as I know, is the first conference that really is going to explore this intersection of energy, um, health, and environment. Other conferences have, have um, address these issues certainly, but we're digging really deep into these. Um, and and one of the things that hopefully um, came out of this webinar today is how um, we're bringing together different perspectives and uh, professionals with different backgrounds and experiences so that uh, we can learn from each other and identify um, opportunities to work together. So um, one of the goals of the conference is to cover a lot of territory, but also make sure that everything is accessible um, to anybody coming, you know, we're going to have medical practitioners in the audience, we're going to have um, engineers, we're going to have community activists, um, lots of different perspectives. So we're really working hard to make sure that the presentations are accessible to all and help foster some dialogue. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And next, a question for Laura. Does National Grid track any health impacts of programs or are there plans to? So the health impact in terms of the benefit of our energy efficiency at this point, um, we don't track that, but that's something that we want to explore. We recently um, uh, included carbon in our metrics for the benefit of our energy efficiency program. And I think that going into the health aspect is the next step. Okay, great, thank you. And this one is for Jalan. Does the Kreisky Foundation work in connection with the Weatherization Assistance Program, for example? Uh, I don't believe that we have worked directly with the Weatherization Program, but I, but I, but there's a couple things that I would mention. We have some place-specific work in Detroit, Memphis, and New Orleans, and I believe our Detroit team has supported the work of an organization called SAW, which uh, works on a couple different things, and I think weatherization is one of them. So I'm happy to, to find out more information about that if that's of interest. Um, I would also say that our health team has specifically worked on healthy housing issues um, in, in, in many cases, and I would think that weatherization is probably a part of that. Um, but I'm happy to find out more specific information if that's of interest. Thank you. And if um, anyone would like more specific information, just type that into the chat box and it can get you connected. Um, and next, we have a question about um, 
Uh, are there ex already examples in the U.S. of energy efficiency programs co-funded by healthcare funding? So maybe I'll put that out to the to the group if anyone wants to take that. I know Sarah, we've, we've done some research on that, but any other speakers would like to take that as well. Yeah, I'll just refer people to the report and um, that we did on this topic and let other people jump in, other speakers jump in. Um, we have uh, a report, uh, shorthand is Next Nexus. If you look at the slide with ACEEE resources, or there it's the fourth bullet, the Next Nexus exemplary programs that save energy and improve health. We looked across 50 programs, and in that report, you can see how they're funded. Um, we also have a directory of 70 programs, and, and these are programs that are identi self-identified as attempting to both save energy and protect health for participants. Um, so that's a good place to look, and I'll just stop there. I guess the short answer is yes, though. Yes, there are programs where um, healthcare funding is being used to support the programs. Great, thank you. And we have another question um, that is, where can I find studies or data on the energy health connection and how energy efficiency improvements help? So if this is maybe I'll put this out to all the speakers. If there are some, some key resources that you know of that you can um, direct people to. Uh, this is Sarah again. I'll just jump in um, first, but there's a uh, we have a number of resources um, and, you know, you look at the reference section of any of these reports and you'll find a whole bunch more. Um, there's also an upcoming webinar um, that we that is not ours, but that is looking at um, they have been measuring health impacts of um, energy efficiency programs in the UK. And so um, there, let's see, we're going to send you a link to it. Um, it's on November 13th. Um, it's recent studies on health impacts from retrofit programs in the UK. Um, and we'll include a link to that when we send the follow up to this webinar. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And any other um, um, of the speakers want to chime in on that? Just general resources that you think would be good to help educate people on the connection between energy and health. Can I add one more? <laughs> that sure. The US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, has done a lot of work in this space and has developed some tools specifically to help people um, quantify some of these health impacts, and they will be conducting a training for how to use those tools at the conference. Okay, great. And um, another question we have is, um, maybe Sarah, if you could describe um, the specific advocacy or policy initiatives in addition to the research that EEEE is doing on energy efficiency and health. So I guess is there, you know, can you speak to um, some of the planned or work or some areas where um, ACEEE or others can engage in advocacy or pol and policy initiatives around health? Um, I can. I, I feel like um, I've been talking a lot and also that this is one that, um, you know, um, I think Mona and uh, maybe Jalan, uh, Jalan would have some um, insight into as well. So um, hopefully they, they maybe feel like jumping in here. Um, but the way that I, I, like, I think my 2019 slide, um, slide of some of the themes, um, that's kind of where I was trying to spell out um, some of those opportunities. But I think another place to look is if you take a look at the program for the upcoming conference, um, what we did is a call for abstracts. So we put out a call of um, what work people are doing and what they think the opportunities are at this intersect. And we got well over 100 different submissions. Um, and so what I think this program actually represents is all of the work and opportunities that organizations across the nation are pursuing where they think there's something to be done at this intersect, either something to learn or some advocacy opportunities. Um, so I'd refer people to that program. So, um, so hi, this is Mona. And um, I think that question uh, was 
really uh, asking about policy and policy work. Um, and so um, I would uh, draw your attention to the current uh, proposed rule, the Affordable Clean Energy Rule, which is the replacement for the Clean Power Plan uh, that the EPA has put forward, um, which um, in its analysis talks about um, the anticipated uh, health impacts that are likely to occur. And uh, so it cites the number of asthma um, exacerbations and, um, and hospitalizations and so forth. Um, and, you know, this is about efficiency of power generation. It's really mainly about the efficiency of, of coal generation. Um, and so there is some very specific uh, data there uh, that, um, you know, that uh, helps understand, helps us understand what the impact on a large scale is going to be of backing away from um, having a, a more aggressive effort to uh, to clean up the uh, the power generating uh, sector, um, and uh, they are taking comments on that rule. Uh, it the comment period actually closes today, um, but in the um, the description of the rule there is this analysis, and so I would definitely point to that analysis. It's you know it's a pretty clear. Um, description by the EPA of what some of the health costs are of backing away from the policies that were in place. Yeah, Great. This thank is you. Uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. This is Jalan. The only thing that I would add is that just a reminder that election day is coming up. And, you know, while we have movement or some type of movement uh, at the federal level, there are so many opportunities at both the state and local level to um, support policies and leaders that uh, get it and, and get this connection. So I'd encourage each of you to, which I'm going to do, is kind of get educated on the folks that are running for leadership and, and make sure that you promote policies that will get to this goal of energy efficiency, health, and just being smarter about how we prepare for climate change and its impacts. Great. Thank you. And last question we'll have here before we close things out. And to those who, whose um, comments I haven't gotten to, um, some of you have requested following up with specific speakers, so I'll get you, you all connected. Um, so the final question, I think, more so for, for Laura, can you speak to how um, electrification and the elimin elimination of combustion impacts in the indoor environment um, can affect occupant health. So kind of speak to, is that incorporated in um, some of the residential programs that National Grid has? Sure, so um, for, for those of you that aren't familiar with the term electrification, it is the um, addition of air source heat pumps to displace fossil fuel heating within a home or um, very inefficient electric baseboard heating. And so uh, basically <clears throat> by displacing the amount of uh, fossil fuel heat that a customer will need, that reduces the amount of the combustion throughout the year in the home, therefore hopefully um, reducing the amount of particulates that could be present in a home, especially if a customer has not properly maintained their heating system. Um, and so electrification is an area now that the utilities are focused on in terms of trying to, um, number one, help help customers get away from uh, dirty dirty fuel, expensive fuel, um, and helping to streamline the, the grid, trying to make a, a cleaner grid, if you will. So having the electric air source heat pumps um, the sense that they're electric to also provides opportunity for them to be powered by renewable energy, so uh, solar resources. Um, and so that helps also with the, the opportunity of eliminating any possible combustion element within the home, um, which as we know, can create uh, health hazards in terms of safety with having any kind of combustion activity. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, that's helpful. 
Um, well, with that, I think we're going to close out the webinar, and I just want to say thank you to the speakers for supporting this work, and um, we really hope that uh, the webinar attendees will consider attending the conference, and if you're already planning to, we look forward to seeing you there. Um, and if not seeing you at the conference, hopefully um, engaging at this intersect of health, environment, and energy in the future, because as you can see from this virtual session alone, there are a lot of different areas um, uh, that are really ripe with opportunity um, and a lot going on in this, in this field. So thank you all for joining and we look forward to connecting with you in the future. Thank you so much. And thanks to ACEEE for taking the lead in such a, uh, you know, a clear way uh, on health.